Another interesting day in the Karen Reed trial. Day number 10 finishes, and we heard today from Brian Albert, Brian Albert Jr., and Caitlin Albert. We are in the middle of Caitlin Albert's cross-examination, which will continue tomorrow. So, as we spoke about in the last video, the defense had the entire weekend to prepare the cross-examination of Brian Albert. Now, of course, like I said, you're always going to have some idea of the cross-examination of the witnesses, but certainly when you hear the direct examination by the prosecutor, it also will help you to come back to some of the points that the prosecutor brought out or maybe think of things that you did not think about before by cross-examination. You had the whole weekend to figure it out. So Alan Jackson gets up. He's very good, very strong on his cross-examination. And we're going to discuss just a few areas in which I felt he could have explored, which he didn't, but nevertheless, a very strong cross-examination. So number one, he starts off by showing that this Brian Albert, he's been a detective for a very long time, a police officer for a very long time, and he must be what you call a professional witness. Anytime you hear in trial that someone's a professional witness, that kind of, at least attorneys believe this, that juries don't like to hear that. That someone's a professional witness, which means he knows this, he's not like on the stand, and he's not intimidated by taking an oath and being in front of a judge and being in front of a jury where he's going to try to only say the truth. When you say that someone's a professional witness, it gives them a certain comfort level in the courtroom, which could make it easier for them, let's say, to not be so truthful because they're so comfortable in this environment already. So that's why a lot of times attorneys want to bring out that this is some that testifying in court is not something new to you. And they're hoping that that will resonate with the jury, that therefore the person may not be 100% truthful and will still be very calm about doing that. All right, so he brought that point out right away. He also then spoke about what conversations he's had or preparations that he's had with Mr. Lally, the prosecutor. And this is also very common when you have a witness who is not represented. So when I say witness are not represented, not represented by one of the parties of the case. He does have his attorney. His attorney was sitting there in the gallery, but he does not have Mr. Lally is not his attorney. And therefore, any communication that Mr. Lally had with this witness is discoverable. You're allowed to talk about it. It's not protected by attorney-client privilege. And that's why also when you have a witness when, that you think maybe the one of the attorneys has spoken to about their testimony, you always want to bring that out and see what they spoke about and ask some questions and make it sound like one of the attorneys are trying to collaborate with the witnesses and coach them into giving certain answers. So that's also something that Alan Jackson wanted to bring out to show that uh, he was prepared or at least prepared or had conversations with, with Mr. Lally. And he did bring that out. He said that they did prepare a little bit. They did a little bit discuss what possible questions could come out in cross-examination. Nothing too damaging, nothing like smoking gun where Mr. Lally is telling you exactly what to say. Nothing like that, but still a decent line to ask about and um, let the jury know about. He testified that he's not really close friends with Brian Higgins, and this is an important part. How close of a friend is Brian Albert with Brian Higgins? It seems from the bar they're pretty close. They traveled together. They had a little bit of a road trip together, um, and they're both police, police officers. They're working um, close to each other. Uh, so it seems that they're friends for sure, but still Brian Albert wanted to create some sort of distance and he said that they he would not be consider brian higgins a close friend and we keep hearing this semantics close friend versus friend versus acquaintance we keep hearing about this and of course because the closer you can tie everybody together the more of a conspiracy that this can be all right now he again testified that he went to the hillside restaurant before he joined everybody at the waterfall he never spoke about Karen Reed with Brian Higgins. And remember, this is one of the points that the defense wants to bring up about Brian Higgins and Karen Reed. What type of relationship do they have? What type of relationship did Brian Higgins want to have with Karen Reed? And he said that, that they've never, they did not speak about his relationship with Karen Reed or his interest in Karen Reed. And one of the things that Alan Jackson brought out was, so he didn't talk to you about his texting and flirting with Karen Reed two weeks before the murder of John O'Keefe, right? Um, so, yeah, he said, of course not. But the point is that you heard that already. The jury heard that. And maybe there's going to be some evidence of that coming out. Now, anytime they talk about the grand jury, uh, the federal grand jury in this case, they're not obviously not a lot of mention federal grand jury. That seems to be a ruling that the judge made. And therefore, when they're referring to these other 
proceedings, they're referring to it as a grand jury proceeding, either a non-commonwealth jury proceeding or a commonwealth grand jury proceeding. And the idea is that because they're not, the judge did not allow them to say federal grand jury. The judge doesn't want that to come in, but still she did allow them to say that this was in a formal type of hearing. And the way that Alan Jackson is dealing with it is referring to either the commonwealth grand jury hearing or the non-commonwealth grand jury hearing. All right. And he brought up some t- statements that he's made to the this grand jury, which we know as the federal grand jury proceeding. And one of the things that he said uh, and actually this was in the the uh, state's grand jury proceeding, is that to, in, in response to the question of did he know Karen Reed, he said that he's never met or seen her before. That's what he testified to. And that was meaning before that time at the waterfall. And then he actually finishes that statement by saying, well, maybe he's met her once. So Alan Jackson did try to score some points this way and say, well, why would the first thing that you say is that I've never met her before when really the next sentence out of your mouth is, well, maybe I've met her once. I don't think it was such a great line because he did like the next sentence change. That he, no, he doesn't mean to say that he never met her before. Maybe he met her, didn't meet her once before, but I think he made a little bit bigger of a deal of it than it really is. So I don't think it was like a real gotcha moment uh, where you may have, uh, if he would have just left his statement as, I've never seen her before, and then you've got, or have never met or seen her before, and then you've got some other uh, impeachment uh, evidence that will show that he did, that would have been much, much more of a gotcha moment than I've never seen or met her before. Oh, yeah, maybe there was one time. So I didn't think that uh, that was such a great you know, moment of the cross-examination. Because it did bring out that a week before this incident, he did meet her, uh, Karen Reed, at the hillside. And there was actually a photo that was taken at the hillside by what seems to be Karen Reed. He didn't want to agree to that. Brian Albert didn't want to agree that it was Karen Reed who took the picture. He said it could have been other people that took the picture. Uh, But the defense attorney knows that it was Karen Reed. That's probably what Karen Reed told him. And that's why she was there. She was taking the picture of him, Brian Albert, and John O'Keefe and some other people there. So obviously they did meet before. Okay, so... Again, nothing I don't think that was just so damaging uh, from that line of cross-examination. Now, he also said that uh, in a, this is in the federal grand jury proceeding, he said that he did not talk to Karen Reed that night at the waterfall. And they showed a clip of him, uh, Brian Albert, at the waterfall with a few people around him. He's standing next to Brian Higgins, and there was another Um, officer to his left. I'm not sure if I forgot who that was, but there were some people around the table. And at one point it does look like he's directing some sort of conversation towards Karen Reed, who's standing there, but it certainly was not a one-on-one conversation that he had with Karen Reed. And I would even venture to say that it doesn't look like he's just directing his comments to Karen Reed. It looks like he's talking to the entire table and he's just shifting his gaze around to different people. And one of the people were Karen Reed. So Again, something that Alan Jackson wanted to show that he was really lying about. And I don't think it was such a great moment, again, in his cross-examination. Another part that he brought out is that when Karen Reed and John O'Keefe entered into the waterfall, there was a question of whether Brian Higgins said anything at that time to Brian Albert. And Brian Albert testified that he didn't. He didn't say anything like, oh, shoot, here's Karen Reed, but she's with that guy, John O'Keefe, who I can't stand, and I just want her as my girlfriend. It didn't seem like he, I mean, at least he testified that he didn't say anything like that. He did testify that, like everybody else, that John O'Keefe and Karen Reed did not appear to be drunk or inebriated in any way. It seemed that they were completely in control of themselves. Then it was asked, who was invited to your house? Who was invited to your house after the waterfall? And he said anybody who wanted. And it wasn't really explored with him, which I think could have been done. It didn't, Alan Jackson did not really uh, explore how that invitation came up, came about. And we've heard some different accounts about exactly how that invitation came about. We've heard that one was just a suggestion to the whole group. And at one point we heard from uh, Nicole Albert that it was just to Jennifer McCabe if she wants to come over and then maybe she spread the word. I think it would have been worthwhile to hear what, what 
Brian Albert would say about everybody coming over to his house. How are they invited? And then maybe you can have already three different versions of how everyone came to 34 Fairview, and it would have been would have been helpful to in cross exam in uh, closing argument to point that out. Uh, but he didn't uh, really explore that. He just said, "Who's invited to come to your house?" He said, "Anybody who wanted." Now. He said that he pulled in with his Ford Edge. When he got to his house, he was driving the Ford Edge, and uh, Brian Higgins uh, came with his car first and then cleared a spot for him. Then he backed out, and then he parked that Ford Edge in the driveway and never moved it again. And that was his testimony, and we know that this is significant because there's going to be some reports that that Ford Edge was actually blocking the area of John O'Keefe where his body lay later on. But again, Brian Albert's testimony is that he parked it in the driveway and never moved it since now he asked uh brian albert about how big of a guy colin albert is and he said colin albert's 511 he's 175 pounds not a huge guy but someone with a little bit of meat on him seems like he's a muscular guy he plays football so he certainly has the capabilities to be somewhat physical with somebody again john o'keefe was seemed to be bigger than that but still colin albert not someone to sneeze at seems like he's can hold his own as well and that's i guess part of why he wanted to bring that part out uh, he did acknowledge that he didn't see Colin Albert leave that day. Remember, the testimony has been that shortly after Nicole and Brian Albert came home, Colin Albert was literally on his way out. But he said he didn't actually, with his own eyes, see him leave. Another interesting part that came out was he uh, he spoke to him about eventually how Sergeant Michael Link was talking to uh, Brian Albert and the people in the house. And he asked him again, this is the question that... It's a, it's, a tr- it's a tough question. Why is Sergeant Michael Lang talking to all these potential witnesses and potential suspects all together? That's not the way it's done. So he asked, he asked Brian Albert, this is the cop for who knows how many years, 30 years, uh, did he feel that it was a conflict for Sergeant Michael Lang, who was very, very close with Chris Albert, and he knows Brian Albert. They're not close friends, but... He still knows the connection between Char- Sergeant Michael Link and the Albert family. And he asked him, was there any conflict between, do you feel that there's any conflict for Sergeant Michael Link asking you questions with everybody? For, number one, is there a conflict? And number two, is there any problem with the way he was interviewing it and the, interviewing everybody? And Brian Albert wanted, responded that, well, he wouldn't really call it a police interview. And therefore, he didn't really feel that there's a conflict. He didn't really feel that there's any problem here. Okay. Now, that could have been explored more, I feel, by Alan Jackson. He could have said, hold on. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Stop, 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 stop. You're saying that this is not a police interview. You're You're saying after a policeman for 30 years that you are not either suspects or witnesses or possible witnesses in this case, and you're telling us that it's not appropriate to have you secluded and segregated and separated on a crime scene that just that somebody died on, on your front lawn. Is, is that what you're telling me, that this is not what you would call a police interview where they have to separate witnesses and talk to everybody separately? Are you really honestly telling us that? Bring that part up and let, and let him say, yes, I don't believe that. And then that's a good point to make on closing argument that this is, this is simple. Every police officer knows that when you're going to a crime scene, you've got to separate witnesses. This isn't the only reason why they got preferential treatment is because Sergeant Michael Link is close with them because he's a Boston police officer and the Albert family is connected. That would be a good point to bring out, but uh, it was not explored. Um, at some point, there was a, some conflict between or inconsistency between whether at one point Brian Albert said that Caitlin Albert left at 12.15 a.m. or if she actually left the, late, the latest, the last of everyone, like around 2 a.m. And it seems like from everyone's testimony that actually Caitlin Albert left at she was the last one to leave uh, at around 2 a.m., so not 12.15. And he said, well, it seems like Sergeant um, Michael Lank's report said that Caitlin left at 12.15, and that's what he was told by Brian and Nicole. Uh, and he asked him about that, the, that inconsistency, and he said, well, there, he's obviously wrong. He's mistaken. He, he made a mistake. It, we never told him that. And, in fact, she left at 2 a.m. after everybody. All right, now he also brought out that he didn't tell Sergeant Link, Michael Link, that Colin was in the house that night. And similar to what Nicole testified, that, well, he was leaving, so she didn't really consider him as part of the group that was there that night. Now, also, he said that he did give an interview um, at Jennifer McCabe's house with Trooper Proctor, Michael Proctor. And he also, at that time, did not say 
that Colin Albert was at the home. So again, just another part to bring out that you didn't say that Colin Albert was there, tr showing that you're trying to cover for each other. But again, not the greatest, not the greatest line because Colin Albert was literally on his way out from the reports, and it's understandable if you won't mention Colin Albert when everyone else is sitting in the kitchen for the next two hours. It's understandable why you would not mention Colin Albert. Um, he also said that during the interview, the other uh, Nicole and Brian Jr., Brian Albert Jr., were there uh, with Sergeant uh, Michael Lenk, so they're all together talking about it. And again, that's certainly inappropriate. Now, what was interesting is that the fact that Jennifer McCabe was being interviewed the next day at um, Jennifer McCabe's house, and Brian Albert made a point of it to go over to his, her house while she was being interviewed. And the suggestion here, what you're, when you're kind of feeling out what Alan Jackson is doing here, is that there's a reason why you're going over there. You're not just going over there because you want to show some uh, support to Jennifer McCabe and, and pat her on the back and hold her hand. That's not really why you're going there, even though that was the testimony so far, that he was just going there because he wanted to give her some support and he knew her for so long and, she felt, and he felt that she was going through something so traumatic and he wanted to be there for her. The suggestion that it seems that Alan Jackson is making is that you went over there because you wanted to make sure that uh, everyone has their story straight and uh, you're, you're buddy buddy with the police and buddy buddy with um, with um, uh, Trooper Proctor and and that's why you were really uh, going over there. So or, or Sergeant Michael Link. So all this it seems a little funny that you're going over there. And he did say that uh, they were separated at that interview. So at that interview, everyone was, uh, everyone was interviewed separately. Apparently, he had no problem with that either. And he thought, didn't say that that was incorrect. You know, he could have come back and said, well, you just told me before that you didn't think it was a problem for everyone to be talking together uh, the night of or the, day, the morning of. How come the next day all of a sudden, uh, or at Jennifer McCabe's house, then you feel that it is appropriate for everyone to be separated? Okay, that's not the greatest, but something I think could have been brought out. Um, he testified that he never went to the basement. And remember, this is part of the suggestion by the uh, defense that John, John O'Keefe was lured into the basement, killed in the basement, dragged outside, thrown on the front lawn, and that's where either he was killed before he got there or he was knocked out so that he died of hyperthermia, whatever. But he said that he never went to the basement. Um, and then we spoke about, and then he spoke about Chloe, the dog, the German Shepherd mix. And he did testify that Chloe started barking when people were coming into the house. So Chloe started barking when people were coming into the house. And you admitted, he also brought out that you admitted, Brian Albert admitted, that she's not great with strangers. Right now, Nicole Albert tried to explain that away and say that, no, he, she, the, dog, the dog was completely fine with human strangers, just animal strangers or other dogs she, the, the German Shepherd Chloe was not so friendly with. But to humans, she was completely fine. That was uh, Nicole's testimony. And Brian seemed to have been more um, willing to say that she's not great with either, even human strangers. Um, and then he brought up the fact that he was that the Chloe was rehomed in May in 2023, even though they had her for six or seven years. Okay, two women went to the hospital because of Chloe. And he also brought out that John, obviously John O'Keefe, would be considered a stranger to Chloe. And then he brought out about the morning when all of these police cars and fire trucks and ambulances were in front of his house with all of their lights and engines running, and he did not wake up from that. And this is really, I think, a very strong point for the defense's case here. How can you not wake up from this? Right in front of your house, all those engines. And on top of that, you have Karen Reed screaming and acting hysterically. And all that... With all that, you don't wake it up. You don't wake up. And he brought up, you weren't wearing an eye mask, something that I spoke about in my last video that he should bring out. You weren't wearing an eye mask. You weren't wearing earplugs. You didn't have any um, CPAP machines. You didn't have uh, any, you weren't on any medications, any sedatives, anything that would make you not wake up from such a commotion. And he acknowledged that he was not in any of this. He didn't wear an eye mask. He had nothing. And all these six emergency vehicles that were parked in front of his house by his bedroom window um, and didn't hear anything, didn't wake up. And he said, not only that, but the dog also slept through it all. Now, I think he could have brought up more about the fact that they both testified that 
Jennifer McCabe burst into the room. Remember, that was a big part of what Nicole testified about. So he didn't explore this. I think that this could have been some great avenues of cross-examination for Alan Jackson. Why didn't he talk about, now, you're telling me that Jennifer McCabe burst into your house. I'm assuming that she burst into the house. The door was open. But she, the same way that she would burst into his bedroom, so then she would probably burst into the house and start running up the stairs. And all of that commotion, the dog wouldn't wake up yet? And the dog wouldn't start barking and wake you up before even Jennifer McCabe reached your bedroom and burst into your bedroom? But that, this whole line, he didn't explore, which I think he could have, and maybe um, made some good points about it. Okay, then he spoke about this exit. There was a spur- there's a special exit from the basement, which you did not have to go through the house in order to get out to, outside to the front yard. There was an there was a, a I think they called it a back a back load. They were able to come out from the basement to the backyard, go through the go through the fence. There's a there's an opening in the fence or, or a door in the fence, and they could have dragged the body right outside by the fence and right opposite where the fence ends is that area where not where it ends, but if you continue on that path, that's where John O'Keefe's body was found. And that's what the defense's case is here. So he did bring this uh, point out that they had this exit there and from the basement to the backyard. Um, and then uh, he also spoke about that, uh, talking about selling the house. And he said that you listed the house in November 2022, which is nine months after John O'Keefe uh, was murdered. And then he also, he buckled down and he said, no, well, we did, uh, even though we listed it then, but we were already speaking to a realtor before. And I guess it just took us a quite a long time to actually list it, which I, again, I think this is a very interesting thing where you got so excited to sell your house in 2021 when the market is so great and you don't even start listing it, listing it till 2022 and don't sell it till 2023. Um, uh, it's just a little interesting. So, and I may have the dates messed up. I'm not, I don't remember exactly when the, he ended up selling the house. So if I made a mistake on that, I apologize. Okay, now he asked him about training that he has regarding a crime scene, clean, if criminals know how to clean up a crime scene. And you would think that as a detective, you should have some training in how criminals try to clean up crime scenes. And that way you can investigate whether any of these measures were taken by potential criminals, right? So he was trying to bring out that you know how to clean up a crime scene, right? Um, okay, then we got into this notice of preservation. Now he had a, there was a notice that was signed by the judge on September 23rd, 2022 to preserve his phone. So Brian Albert had to preserve his phone September 23rd, 2022. That was when the judge signed the order. Now, of course, the order has to be mailed, served on Brian Albert. So this we're talking, probably talking a few days later when he actually got it. He claims that he never received it. This is what Brian Albert claims. He never received this notice of preservation that you have to preserve your phone. That's what he claims. And there's a stipulation, in fact, that came out, meaning that both the prosecution and the defense agreed that the prosecutor was fine with stipulating that they actually sent him this notice. So it's not that the the Commonwealth is not going to claim that they never sent him this notice. They are agreeing that we sent him this notice. And by him saying that he never received it, that's his problem. But that's the testimony that he's sticking with. Now, he claims he didn't receive the notice, and therefore, he was only told about it after he upgraded his phone. So he traded in his phone, they wiped it back to factory settings, and uh, he got a new phone. And that date that he got the new phone was September 22nd, 2022. And according to his testimony, it was just a coincidence and that just happened to be when he got the deal. Maybe he got a text saying, hey, you can upgrade your phone now. It's for a special deal, whatever it is, all the texts that we all get all the time. And he took advantage of that. And it just so happens to be that it was the day before the order that was signed with the judge that he has to preserve that phone, the actual physical phone. Now, then they spoke about whether uh, he t- testified about telling Brian Higgins that he's getting rid of his phone. So here there was some 
some testimony that he said, yeah, I did have some conversations with Brian Higgins about phones. I don't know specifically if it was about getting rid of our phones, but there were certain conversations about it. And it just so happens to be that Brian Higgins also upgraded his phone or got rid of his phone. Okay, so that was an interesting part of this whole equation. Now, here's the other part. The other part is, is that even if you get rid of your actual phone, everything's really supposed to be backed up and everything's supposed to be transferring onto your new phone. And therefore, the suggestion is it doesn't matter if you actually get rid of the actual real phone if you can really just pull all the same data from the new phone anyway. So what's this whole big deal that you're making about the old phone? Everything is saved to the iCloud and then you are able to download it onto the new phone. However, there could be an argument made that not everything gets backed up on the iCloud and you can choose certain things, you can still delete certain things and there could have been some foul play there. So that was a suggestion there. Uh, anyway, it doesn't look that great that literally the day before the judge signed an order to preserve his phone, that's when he coincidentally upgraded his phone and got rid of his old phone. He also testified that Michael Proctor did not come to his, ho to his home until February 3rd which is, again, it's a few days after, right? January 28th, 29th, and he didn't come till February 3rd. And if so, he tried to bring out that isn't it important to do your investigation right away? In fact, isn't there a show, 48 hours, showing that right away, have to, but that was objected to. Um, still, the jury heard it, and still, it's true. Of course, you want to do your investigation right away and get as much um, evidence and information that you can right away, and bringing out the point that he didn't really even, even come to his home till February 3rd. No investigators came into his house to take pictures. And he, to this, he answered, no, I wish they had. Suggesting that if they would have, then my whole family wouldn't have been put through this whole conspiracy that we were part of this whole cover-up. So I wish they would have. And to this, uh, Alan Jackson responded very quickly, yeah, me too. <laughs> Showing that he actually, if they would have done that, then Karen Reed would be a free woman now. And it would have been very clear that you did cover this all up. So a little bit uh, back and forth there. No investigation was done in the house. That came out. Um, another part that he brought out was that he was part of the Marines. He was in the Marines for four years. Brian was in the Marines, and he was trained in hand-to-hand -hand combat. That's one of the things that you treat, that you uh, train for in the Marines, uh, as well as defensive techniques in police training. Right? So this is all basic part of his uh, Ryan Albert's training. He also had some training in boxing before. So you see that this guy, Brian Albert, can be a very dangerous person. You know, any Marine is probably can probably kick anybody else <laughs> straight to the floor. Um, yeah, regardless, and on top of that, he had this other defensive training by the police and as well as training in boxing. Now, here's also an interesting part that came out, which is just, it's, again, it's something that's just making you scratch your head and really trying to understand what really went on here. And this was about the phone and the phone calls to Brian Higgins at around 2.20, 2.22 in the morning. Okay, so officially everybody left the Brian Halbert home at around 2 a.m. And they, that's when Brian and Nicole went up to sleep. They didn't care or bother to check the door to make sure that it was locked. Okay, whatever. We spoke about that in the last video. Um, they go up to bed. And he said that he's watching television. And at 2.22, he gets a phone. He calls Brian Higgins for one second. That's what it shows up on his phone and his phone records, that he called Brian Higgins at 2.22 for one second. So his question to him was, how in the world did that happen? You were sleeping, right? Well, he said, first he was saying that really it seemed to have been a pocket dial, right? a pocket dial or a butt dial. Sometimes people just back and put the phone in their pocket and it'll just dial somebody or the last person that you spoke to or one of the last people that you spoke to. This does happen occasionally. And he said, well, first of all, what's the phone doing with you in bed, right? You're in bed. Most people, when you go into bed, you put your phone in the charger. You charge your phone overnight. Well, he said that, no, he always keeps his phone with him. Now, sometimes he recharges it, but he always keeps his phone with him. And it's not so hard to swallow that somebody would keep their phone with them uh, and not necessarily charge them. Like you're always, a lot of people are with computers or they're in their cars and they're able to recharge them throughout the day, even if they're not recharging it plugged in at home overnight so it's not so hard to swallow but nevertheless he testified that he did not charge it he did not charge it he it was with him in his bed and that's his normal practice his normal practice is to sleep with his phone in his bed and still that's how it must have been a pocket dial now it seems to have come out in certain grand jury testimony that he was actually having an intimate moment with his wife nicole 
And during that intimacy, somehow the phone was around somewhere and that's how it got dialed. And again, it's hard. The only way that this makes any sense is if uh, the phone wasn't locked. And then it can make sense that a few buttons were pressed as, as he was in his bed um, and the phone was underneath him. Somehow it got dialed uh, to recent calls and he called Brian Higgins. And here's the other part. It called for a second and then it hung up. So to have that type of pocket dial where sometimes, I mean, some of us have gotten pocket dials from other people in the past, right? So let's use our own personal experience. If I get a pocket dial sometimes, and sometimes I do get pocket dials uh, from different older people usually, usually the pocket dial, if I say hello, it's going on for, for a long time, it's going on for a while until either I hang up and usually get called back the next second because the person's pocket dial is still pocket and it's still dialing me or there's just no answer. It's very, very rare to get a pocket dial and then hang up. Who hung up? So... I think in my experience, again, maybe you can tell me if you've had different experiences, but in my experience, when I get a pocket dial from someone, it goes on. It's not just a dial, I answer it, and then the second later, it's, it's hung up. That's usually somebody purposely realizing, oh, shoot, I pocket dialed somebody, and he hangs up right away. But here, the testimony was that he didn't realize it. Everything was all without his realizing anything. Everything was a pocket dial. And it does, it's just very hard to swallow, it's just hard to think that that's actually what happened here. So, all right. Now, the jury is allowed to take in their personal experiences uh, as they're listening to testimony and deciding on credibility. So I think that would be certainly something uh, in closing arguments to talk to the jury about, saying, take your all personal experiences. Do you ever get a pocket dial for one second? Or have you ever pocket pocketed dial somebody else for one second? It's just strange. Now, he also said that Brian Higgins called him back for 27 seconds. So at 2.22 a.m., Brian Higgins called 27 seconds later after that one second phone call, Brian Higgins calls him back. Now this could happen if, um, for Brian Higgins at least, Brian Higgins was up, let's say, if he was up and he gets a phone call for somebody from his friend for a second and then it hangs up, so then you say, oh, okay, let me call that person right back. Maybe he was just nervous I was sleeping and I'm really up, so let me call him right back. I don't know yet. It seems that some of the testimony is going to come out that actually Brian Higgins is going to testify that he also pocket dialed uh, or butt dialed Brian Albert. I'm not sure. Seems to that may that may have been the suggestion here and that may have happened. That's even stranger that they both pocket dial each, each other within 27 seconds of each other. It would make more sense that he called him, hung up, and then Brian, Brian Higgins called him back 27 seconds later. And that, la- and that call lasted for 22 seconds. Now, how can a call last for 22 seconds? It doesn't ring for 22 seconds. So, and he also said that there was no voicemail left. So there's no voicemail left for Brian Higgins. He didn't realize, or he didn't, he didn't, he didn't get a voicemail from Brian Higgins. So what happened for that 22 seconds? What happened there? Nobody answered the phone and there's no voicemail. What were the 22 seconds? Just ringing? I don't, know if, I don't know if a phone rings for 22 seconds. And I'm not even sure if it starts counting until the person actually answers the phone or if it goes to voicemail. Maybe we'll hear more from the phone experts about that. But that's also very, very strange about these phone calls. He spoke about missed calls. Does he know how to recognize a missed call on his iPhone? You know, when it's red, that shows that there's a missed call. And he said he's not, this, this is what Brian Albert said. He said he's not even sure that a missed call looks red on, a, on an iPhone. Again, that's a little strange. Now, he does see that sometimes it says missed call. Then he can say, yeah, it says missed call, but that he was fighting back about whether it looks red in recent calls, a missed call. He was trying to come back with that. And he also acknowledged that there's a four-digit passcode or it's face recognition in order to open up his phone. And he did say in, possible, in, in previous testimony that it's possible or that it's only possible that he answered the phone. Nobody else would have answered the phone, not Nicole, not the dog. But he doesn't remember. And he also testified that, I guess I could have spoken with him. So he did say that, those words. I guess I could have spoken with him. So which one is it? But he still said, he said he doesn't remember saying that. And then the fi- for finally, uh, Alan Jackson wanted to bring out the fact of how many different phone calls he made the next morning, 7.20 a.m. 
calls Brian Higgins again. He calls Jennifer McCabe, and he calls. He goes through all the different phone calls that he made. Brian Higgins again. Uh, Brian Higgins calls him and uh, Kevin Albert, and then Chief Berkowitz, and you see all of these people being called that next morning, and he's trying to show, are you sure that you weren't just all getting together and figuring out what your story is going to be because you really killed John O'Keefe? And uh, that was his last part, part that he was bringing out during cross-examination. Now, on redirect, um, he tried to explain, or the prosecutor tried to bring out of Brian Albert, what does it mean that Chloe, the dog, is not, is not so good with strangers? And his answer to this was the following. This was Brian Albert's answer to this. When I say that she's not so good with strangers, it means, what I mean to say, is that she's not overly affectionate to strangers okay that's that's not exactly how i would define not good with strangers that's how i would define that this is a dog that's not overly affectionate so she's not all over strangers and licking them and jumping on them and wanting to be petted and hugged and okay so she's not overly affectionate that doesn't mean that she's not good with strangers so why use it, it that definition generally makes sense and then he said and since she's a heavy dog, so people who don't like dogs wouldn't want her around them. So if you're a person that doesn't like dogs necessarily, and you go to the Albert's home and you have got this huge dog, you may not want that dog around you. What does that have to do with Chloe being not good with strangers? That's just because you don't like dogs, so maybe you're not going to like her. That has to do with you, not with Chloe. So... I feel that his answer here didn't, wasn't really a great answer. He said, Brian Albert said that, he, that Chloe is not good with strangers. And then the response, his explanation is that she's not overly affectionate with strangers. That's the only thing that actually connects to the dog. And to say you're not overly affectionate with strangers doesn't mean that you're not good with strangers. So not such, not the greatest explanation there. Okay, then he also said that the bulkhead doors were positioned right by the kitchen where everyone is hanging out. So if Brian Higgins and Brian Albert decided to murder John O'Keefe and drag him out of those bulkhead doors from the, from the, from the basement up to the, to the backyard, they would have come out right in the middle of the, right where the kitchen faces, the, that bay window in the kitchen where everybody was hanging out. And those doors creak and they're very loud. And everybody would have realized, they would have, everybody would have looked there, saw what was going on. So either they're all in on it, if this really happened, the way that their defense is trying to make it look, or they couldn't have hid it from them. All right. Now, he also pointed out that this motion to preserve Brian Albert's phone, his physical phone, this motion was filed by the defense team. And therefore, because this motion was filed by the defense team, initially the judge put out an order to preserve the phone until there's a ruling on this motion and after the motion was filed that's when this seems like that's when this order was entered but what do you know the motion was denied so the judge denied the motion so you really under the court order you don't have to preserve your phone after that motion uh, was filed and heard the judge ruled that you don't have to preserve the phone so the, the prosecutor wanted to bring out see even what they're arguing that there was a motion to preserve your phone that motion was denied so you're free to get rid of that phone right um, so that was a good point that he brought out. However, on recross, he, Alan Jackson pointed out that the motion was not heard till October. And the preservation order was in September. So between September and October, you couldn't know for sure what the judge was going to rule, right? And also, this is all really irrelevant because you got rid of the phone September 22nd. And the preservation order was signed by the judge September 23rd. So did you know what was going on? All right, so some questions about there. Now, also, the, he also brought out uh, in, on redirect that uh, his experience with boxing was like 20 years ago. So there was some sort of boxing that he used to do with the Boston Police Department, and that boxing, that training for boxing was over 20 years ago. Um, also, there was some point of the cell phone reception being terrible in the home. So their cell phones apparently didn't have such great reception, what he called the dead zone. And therefore, a lot of the... I guess a lot of the phone calls were dropped and 
people can would just be ringing and ringing, ringing, and maybe maybe that would be an explanation for why he couldn't get a, why what happened with Brian Higgins. I guess that might be some of the reason. Now, also something that I think could have been brought out by Alan Jackson, which was not, was two other parts. Number one is what about the donuts? Remember the donuts that Brian Albert Jr. would always get. There were some so many questions about those donuts. So I think the more you explore about those donuts, the more interesting answers you may get. This ritual that Julie Albert would always get six donuts and leave them in, her, in Brian Albert Jr.'s freezing car and that his car would be unlocked. Like, what did Brian Albert Sr. know about that? Talk about that. Try to bring out some more information about that. Also, the fact that there's different accounts of exactly what Jennifer McCabe said when she burst into their bedroom According to Brian Albert's testimony, she said something to the effect that John is dead. And according to Nicole Albert, she never said the word that John is dead. She just said something happened to John. So it's definitely worthwhile, I think, exploring what exactly did Jennifer McCabe tell you when she burst into your room and woke you up? According to your wife, she didn't say a word about John being dead. And you said that he did, she did say that John is dead. All right. So... Also, again, like I said, I think it's interesting that if she would have burst into the house and ran up the stairs and burst into the, the dog wouldn't have heard all this and woken up himself and started barking, stranger coming into the house. All right. So I think certainly some interesting things to think about. Then Brian Albert Jr. took the stand. Um, nothing really too exciting by Brian Albert Jr.'s testimony. Um, he did say that John and Karen never came into the home. That's what everyone's gonna, in the house is going to say. Um, and then he also testified this was, I think, the most interesting part of his testimony, is that he looked outside the windows and he saw Karen's car, which he didn't describe it as Karen's car. He just explained, gave the description of Karen's car, uh, you know, this black SUV, which probably a Lexus. Uh, he didn't say, I don't think he said Lexus, but this essentially Karen's car, which we all know and understand to be Karen's car, that Karen's car was parked outside and he was just looking out the window to see uh, that Julie Nagel, Julie was his friend that came over to celebrate his birthday with him, uh, something also interesting is that it seems like only uh, females came to celebrate his birthday with him. Uh, according to the reports, uh, according to the testimony that we've had so far, it seems like there were only females there. Um, but I don't know what to make of it. So um, he did say that he was looking out to see them, that Julie got in, by her, that she was going. her brother came to pick her up, and he was looking out. And um, he, he, did see, um, he did see Karen's car parked closer to the mailbox and then later he saw that the car moved closer to the flagpole so all the way up so the car according to brian albert jr's testimony the car started off by the mailbox and then moved all the way up to the flagpole i remember what the theory here is is that it, it was thrown into reverse and gunned it until it hit 20 something 24 25 miles per hour we haven't heard, we haven't heard testimony about this yet but from the reports that's what we we uh, can anticipate the testimony being that that's what happened here. So here you have the first piece of evidence uh, from his testimony saying that her car was initially by the mailbox and then it got moved up or she moved it up, seems, to the flagpole. And then he also said that he noticed tracks, snow tracks in the snow showing Karen's car moving up. So he saw the tire tracks in the snow from the window where he was standing through the snow and the blizzardy conditions. Maybe it wasn't so blizzardy then, but that's what his testimony was, that he actually saw the snow tracks. Okay, eventually Julie came back into the house. She was going get to a, get a ride later, so she did not take that ride with her home, uh, with her brother, and she eventually took a, uh, um, I think Jennifer and Matt McCabe took them home. Then he said he didn't hear anything until his father woke him up. Brian Albert Sr. Broke him up, woke him up around 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning, knocked on his door. Um, then he also talked about this ritual, and they keep calling it a ritual, which also it's interesting that they keep calling this this ritual, not a tradition or not some other word. Uh, but they have this ritual that a Julie ever gets some six donuts and a card, uh, and uh, he did speak about that as well. Nothing so amazing, amazing on cross-examination. The only thing that came out, which I thought was a little bit interesting, is that Brian Higgins didn't say goodbye to anybody that night. He just kind of did an Irish goodbye, kind of just left, and nobody not saying goodbye to anybody, or at least that was Brian Albert Jr.'s testimony. All right, then we started with Caitlin Albert. Caitlin Albert also, nothing too 
exciting there, nothing that we haven't really heard too much before. Um, uh, but she was the one, last one to leave the house. And she left the house at 2 a.m. Her boyfriend picked her, picked her up and um, they were driving in the same direction where if she would have been looking out the window, uh, her passenger side window, then it's possible that she could have seen a body on the front yard. However, she said that she did not look that way because she was talking to her boyfriend, Tristan. So that's why she was not even looking out that way. It was already snowing, and she was just not paying attention to see if there was a body lying there or not. Okay, the cross-examination came out that, uh, we just started with cross-examination, but that Trooper Proctor did not interview her, Caitlin Albert, at all. The entire 2022 And it took him until August 2023 to interview her. And she actually gave testimony, it seems, to the grand jury in May of 2023. And then only after that, it seems that Trooper Proctor interviewed her. I think that's what came out from the cross-examination. All right, they're just getting into Kate McLaughlin. Uh, They're high school friends, which they share friends. They tried to explain who's who's Kate McLaughlin. And we're getting also into Courtney Proctor. And that is where the day ended. So we will pick it up tomorrow with cross-examination of Kaylin Albert. And we'll see what who else is on deck to testify in the Karen Reed trial. Well, that's it for now. Thanks for watching. Please, if you haven't liked, subscribe, like, and we will see you next time.